We're pleased that you've tuned into this sermon. It's part of a larger worship experience here at the church. And our prayer is that as you listen, God has a word for you. What kind of sermon series would make sense in the middle of a bitterly contested presidential election? <laughs> uh, that's what the pastors were kicking around a few months ago. And uh, there were a lot of suggestions, a lot of ideas as to uh, what sermon series might be really the, the right focus for us uh, over the next couple months. And we uh, settled upon the idea that maybe a good focus for us would be the new kind of life or the new quality of life that God wants to produce in us, both as individuals and also as a community of faith. In a world like ours that we all know is broken and hurting, uh, what is it exactly that God is trying to build up in us uh, that we can then share with the world? And so we have a sermon series over the next couple months uh, drawing from the so-called fruit of the Spirit that Paul identifies in the fifth chapter of his letter to the Galatians. It was either that or a sermon series from the book of Revelation <laughs> on the apocalypse, <laughs> the, the end of the world. But uh, we're going to hold off on that and uh, go straight for the fruit of the Spirit. Now, whenever we are in the, the book of Galatians, the letter that Paul wrote to the Galatian church, and especially in the fifth chapter, where we're going to be spending some time over the next several weeks, we need to understand that Paul is really focused on this whole issue of freedom. How is it that we can and should exercise our freedom in Christ? And this is a little counterintuitive because oftentimes when people think about making a confession of faith in Jesus Christ and joining a church, uh, they might think that their freedom is actually going to become sort of curtailed in some manner or way. Maybe you've heard this. Maybe someone has told you this. Or maybe you even thought it yourself that, you know, if I make a commitment to, to follow this Jesus and if I join a community of faith like a church, maybe my freedom is going to be impinged upon. Maybe I'm going to join a church and they're going to take my freedom away and tell me what to think and how to act. Have you ever heard that one? Well, a lot of people think that way. And in Paul's understanding, nothing could be further from the, church, from the truth. In his understanding, the, the legacy or the birthright that we have through coming to faith in Jesus Christ is freedom. Because the gospel proclaims through the life and death and resurrection of this Jesus, the power of sin and even death has been broken. And so in his understanding, we are then liberated or we are made free to actually choose. How are we going to live our lives? Uh, every letter that Paul wrote, and particularly this letter to the Galatian Christians, it's like he's writing to freed slaves. He wants them to stay centered in their freedom. In the 13th verse of the 5th chapter, he declares this quite clearly. For you were called to what? Freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence. Now here's where the rub comes. As free people, as the gospel has broken again that power of sin and death, Paul thought, well, we really do then have the ability to choose how we're going to live our lives. Are we going to give in to self-indulgence? Are we going to pursue our passions and pleasures? Are we going to be led uh, in, in the wrong direction? Because if that happens, certain things are going to just show up over time. And he describes those for us. You know, now the works of the flesh, that's a path of self-indulgence. We choose that path. The works of the flesh are obvious. Fornication, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, anger, quarrels, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. <laughs> Anybody want to sign up for that? Well, uh, sadly, some of us have, right? And, and we have chosen that path. Paul calls it the flesh. It's not like he's saying the material self is somehow entirely evil. The flesh here means that that choice that we can make in life for selfishness, for self-centeredness, for self-indulgence, 
to pursue our passions and our enthusiasms above all else. And that is just gonna, it's gonna produce these things in our lives. And that's happened for many of us here today. We got to that point and we saw how our lives were developing and we said, I don't want that. I want something better. And so there's another choice we can make and that is uh, for God. We can choose to the best of our ability to love and to seek and to serve God. And as we do that over time, Paul believes, uh, the Holy Spirit is going to produce something else in us. It's nothing we're going to do. God's going to make it happen in us. And he describes that kind of life this way. By contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And again, this is not something that you and I can make happen in and of ourselves. This fruit of the Spirit is something that the Holy Spirit is going to produce in us if we're open to it. And today we're going to start the series off in talking about love. Uh, love is one of the fruit of the Spirit, and it's by its placement, I think we can reasonably infer the most important. Now, whenever we talk about love, particularly in the sanctuary, we need to be very clear what we're talking about. Because in our culture, love has a, a very wide, shall we say, semantic range. It can mean a whole lot of things. And most of the time when we use that word love, we're talking about something that's really rooted in our feelings. It's a it's an emotional, it's a connection, it's an attachment to other people, right? Often, most often, when we use that word love, in, in our cultural context, that's what we're talking about. But in the New Testament, and particularly when one particular word is used for love, agape, and that's the word that Paul uses in Galatians 5, that word agape in the Greek language that we translate as love actually means something a good deal more than that. Uh, the Scottish theologian William Barclay has a wonderful way of describing it to us, I think. Agape, the Christian word, means unconquerable benevolence. It means that no matter what a person may do to us by way of insult or injury or humiliation, we will never seek anything else but their highest good. It is therefore a feeling of the mind as much of the heart. It concerns the will as much as the emotions. It describes the deliberate effort, which we can make only with the help of God, never to seek anything but the best, even for those who seek the worst for us. Wow. Now, I think at this point, if most of us are willing to be honest, we'll say to ourselves something like, well, that's beautiful. That's wonderful. How nice would it be to live my life on the principle of unconquerable benevolence, not only to the people I like, but to the people who I don't like and who don't like me and might actually be uh, seeking to, uh, to do me ill or wrong. Unconquerable benevolence. It's beautiful but it might be a little too much. Maybe there's a lesser fruit that I can aspire to. <laughs> you know, maybe something like pleasantness. I think with God's help, I could achieve pleasantness in my life. I could be pleasant to most of the people most of the time. <laughs> can I have that fruit instead? Pleasantness. Well, sadly, no. Uh, you saw the list. It's not on the list. <laughs> but love is. Why? Well, because love is rooted in the very identity of who God is and who we are called to be as God's children, having been created in God's image. And this is laid out, I think, so wonderfully in Scripture. One of the clearest places is 1 John chapter 4, where the author writes, Let's read this together because this is really something like a confession of faith. God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. 
Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness on the day of judgment, because as he is, so we are in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because he first loved us. Those who say, I love God, and hate their brothers or sisters are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. The commandment we have from him is this. Those who love God must love their brothers and sisters also. So God is love. That's, that's who God is. And what the gospel affirms at its core is that God extended God's self into the human condition, into your life and into my life in love. That through Jesus, God has reached us with a message of reconciliation and hope and most importantly, love. And when we receive that good news of the gospel, we're centered in grace. And we can put aside fear. You know, the author of, of 1 John wants us to understand we don't need to live in fear anymore. We have so many questions about who God is. Are we under God's judgment? Do we have a future of any kind? What awaits us when we leave this life for the life to come? So many questions. And what the gospel affords us this radical incursion into the human condition by nothing less than God's very presence made known to us in Jesus Christ is we put aside fear of God because God is love. And we are centered now in God's presence in a place of grace, mercy, love, and forgiveness. And it is then from that place of grace, do you see, that we are then called as image bearers of God to love others. To do it even when it's hard and difficult and challenging. To love even people who might not love us back at all. But we love because he first loved us. And as I said, anytime we talk about the fruit of the Spirit, we have to be very clear this is not something that we can gin up on ourselves. If you think what I'm trying to say today is that we all have to work harder to be more loving, that's not what Paul would have us understand. This isn't something we can develop. This is something that God wants to develop in us over time by the Holy Spirit if we're open to it. And that means the most important thing that you and I can do is pray and ask God for this gift of love, which is the very presence of God to be turned loose in our lives. I loved Lauren's prayer of confession this morning because it was centered on love. And it reminded me that, you know, just about every week during the prayer of confession, that's what I'm praying for. You know, I know sometimes we look around the sanctuary during the prayer of confession and ask ourselves, what are the people around me asking forgiveness for? You ever wondered that? Like, you know, just curiosity. I wonder what they're asking God to forgive them for. Well, then we go back to our own prayer of confession, of course. But we don't share that. That's between us and God. But if you ever wonder, a lot of times when I'm sitting in this front pew, what I'm acknowledging to God, it's that I have not loved people during the course of the week like I know I should have, like I'm capable of, but I just didn't do it. And, and I'm not in that prayer of confession then saying to God, you know, God, I'm going to do better next week because I know I probably won't if it's just me. What I ask God is to fill me with God's love in a new way, is to, through the Holy Spirit, build up that fruit in me so that the following week I'll do a better job, not because I did it, but because God did it through me. And that means that loving other people in this way, even when it's hard, even when it's difficult, that's something we can aspire to even though we know we're always going to fall short. We can do that because of grace. We already know we're loved. We already know we're forgiven. We don't have to earn our way with God. It's not about that. And, and beyond that, psychologists and, and philosophers want us to understand 
it's okay, in fact, it's better than okay, it's actually preferable to have things that we are aspiring to in life that are beyond us and we're probably never going to fully achieve because some of our deepest happiness in life comes from pursuing things that we're never going to actually obtain. And love is like that. We know that we're going to fall short, but the happiness comes even when we fail knowing that we can rise up again and with God's help, do better as we move forward. Love is worth our deepest and most sincere aspirations. So love is how God reaches us. The gospel is clear. And once we are reached and reconciled to God, love is how we then reach out into the world around us when it's easy and fun and also when it's difficult and even painful. That's the power of love. To illustrate this point, a favorite preacher of mine by the name of Fred Craddock had a wonderful story. He died about 10 years ago, but Fred Craddock was one of those preachers who was actually an instructor of homiletics as well. He, he had a wonderful way of telling stories that really just uh, drilled into a point beautifully. And, and one of his stories that I've always uh, treasured uh, concerns a time when a, a family was uh, in the car driving to a particular destination. Dad's behind the wheel, mom's in the car, the two daughters are in the back seat, everything's going fine. But then at one point, kind of randomly, the shriek comes out of the back seat, Dad, stop the car! And he slams on the brakes. And before he can even turn around and ask his two daughters what in the world is going on, they're out the door. And they've rushed back to the side of the road where there is this mangy cat that is just collapsed. It does, barely has the strength to raise its head. It's emaciated. It's covered with fleas. This cat is just as close to death as an animal can be. And when dad reaches his daughters and mom's there too, uh, the daughters look up at him and one of them asks, Ask what? You know what. Can we take this cat home with us? And dad's response is gentle but firm. He says, no, because we already have too many pets, and this cat is too far gone. It's clearly diseased and is dangerous maybe, and, and we don't know what we're dealing with here, so we're going to leave the cat here, and we're going to go down and find animal control, and they'll come back. And the cat probably won't even live that long anyway. Now at this point, he looks over at his wife, and she says to him, you know this is going to happen, don't you? <laughs> right? You figured that one out? And so he shakes his head, and, and he, he reaches down to gently grab the cat by the scruff of the neck. And, and when, his hat draw, or when his hand draws near to the cat, the cat, with whatever strength it has left, draws claws and just rakes the back of his hand viciously and draws blood. And he's really upset now. But he manages to get the car started again. The cat's there with the daughters. He's urging them not to touch it, but, you know, they're, they're doing the best they can. They make it home. He only wants the cat in the garage. That's not going to work. They bathe the cat several times. They, they tend to the cat's wounds. They feed it about a gallon of milk. And about a month later, a man comes into the house. He's got the mail in his hand, and he's reading it, and he, he, he notices something is brushed up against his leg. And he looks down, and it's the cat. But the cat is just sleek and purring. And without thinking, he, he, he reaches his hand down, right? But the cat arches her back in order to get a scratch. And he thinks to himself, this can't be the same cat. Well, of course it's not the same cat, and, and we all know why. And, and this is how Fred Craddock often ended this story. Not too long ago, God reached out a hand to bless me and my family. And when that happened, I looked at God's hand, and it was covered with scratches. Such is the hand of love. 
we love because he first loved us. Amen. We invite you to get to know our community better. You can do that by exploring our YouTube channel and do hit subscribe and check notifications so we can send you any future updates. You can also explore our community of faith at the church website, lopc.org. And we hope you know there's always a place for you here.